Thank you, Warren. Happy Memorial Day to all of you. Aren't we blessed to, with all its faults to live in this country uh, and to think of all the people, some of you, uh, who have served and uh, risked your lives. Some of you lost uh, family members defending our freedoms. Uh, we were praying this morning on the way here. What a blessing to have the freedom uh, to be able to get in our cars and come here and read the, the Bible and talk about Jesus and pray together. So such a such a blessing. Well, turn in your Bibles. We'll continue our study in uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, in Luke chapter 7. This is now, I think, our uh, one, two, third lesson in Luke. And in our passage this morning, uh, we come to something of an interlude, uh, one that reminds us that at any one time that is present, uh, there is also a past uh, connected to it, and a future uh, that's certain, uh, but known only to the divine. As we follow Luke's narrative, the present is plain enough. Uh, Jesus gave back life to the dead only son of a widow living in the city of Nain, and in verse 17 of chapter 7, remember, uh, Luke tells us the report of it went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding uh, district. Uh, not only that, uh, but now in the next verse, which begins the section we're going to study uh, today, we learn that the disciples of John the Baptist go and report to him about all the things presently uh, taking place. John's interest is going to be in what the future holds, but uh, the very mention of John uh, takes us back to the past. Where has he been? Uh, he was front and center in the early chapters of the gospel. You know that because you know this gospel well, but uh, his miraculous uh, birth described at length in the first chapter, and then in the third chapter, his spectacular ministry that made him famous and, and brought to him out in the wilderness masses of people uh, to listen to him. But he himself had sought only to shine light on the promised one to come. Uh, he was only a voice, he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. One is coming, he proclaimed, who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. And that one, John foresaw, would bring judgment uh, and vindicate the Lord's people even as his enemies were vanquished. His winnow winnowing fork, he said in the third chapter, <clears throat> is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John appointed uh, people. Uh, to that certain uh, future and, and boldly urged repentance and faith before the coming day of the Lord. He was a preacher of righteousness uh, who had not even hesitated to condemn the ruler, Herod, uh, for his illicit affair with his brother's wife, Herodias. And that landed uh, John in prison. And that's where John has been when we begin reading in verse 18 in a fetid dungeon far away at the gloomy fortress of Machiris on the east side of the Dead Sea. That's not on our vacation itinerary, is it? Um, and there alone, he was able only to rely on scattered uh, reports that came his way to feed his curiosity about Jesus. So Luke is explaining uh, today, uh, after first uh, the healing of the centurion's slave and then the resurrection of the dead son of the widow, uh, this frenzy had swept through the land and the report concerning Jesus spread far and wide, even as we now learn beyond the iron barred walls of Machiris to this imprisoned John the Baptist. And our 
passage evolves into uh, more than a simple interlude separating Jesus' miraculous acts and subsequent events, but more of a commentary unfolding uh, their meaning. So let's begin reading. I'm going to read today, it's a long passage, in three separate sections. So let's read verses 18 through 23 first. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things, uh, summoning two of his disciples. John sent them to the Lord saying, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? At, their, at that very time, he uh, cured. <laughs> it's getting worse, guys. Uh, <laughs> at that very time, he cured uh, many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits. And he gave sight to many who were blind. Now we're in 22. And he answered and said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. So uh, locked in prison, John the Baptist had a question for Jesus. Is it you uh, we are to look for? Are you the expected one or someone else? But why did John feel the need to ask this particular uh, question? Uh, we must admit, it sounds uh, strange coming from the lips of one who has been portrayed only in the most favorable uh, light to think that the great John the Baptist of all people uh, could have had doubts about Jesus and wondered if he had misread the entire situation. He had long insisted to all who would listen that Jesus was the prophesied one to come, but now he appears far less uh, confident. And because of that, uh, some students of the gospel have even conjectured that John's question was aimed at helping his own doubting disciples to find assurance, that he had had them ask the question in order to bolster their faith, his, his, his own disciples' uh, faith. Uh, but the Lord, in verse 22, who, who knew all men's hearts, makes clear who needed the bolstering. Go and report to John, he said. It was John who, uh, enduring the pent-up frustration of prison, and without uh, reports of any kind of triumphant uh, moves on the part of Jesus to wield that winnowing fork and bring justice to the nation was beginning to wonder exactly what was going on. I think we can all understand that. Uh, what's going on? And I think confusion is really the proper word to explain what this is and that doubt is a discordant idea when applied to John. Or it may have been confusion beginning to lead uh, to doubt. However we interpret it, uh, surely we can all identify with it. Uh, John was a great man. As Jesus will go on to say, even the greatest of uh, men. But he was not perfect. And our imperfections in this life can often weaken our faith, can't they? Uh, our imperfections can often weaken our faith and bring us, if not to what we would admit to be doubt, at least to feelings of confusion. Uh, the experiences of life uh, and the inevitable trials that come our way and the reality that now we see through a mirror only dimly, as Paul would say later in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, combine to occasionally stymie clear thinking and bring some combination of confusion and doubt to the best of us. But the antidote to both, to both confusion and doubt, and this is something that we must relentlessly reinforce, the antidote is revelation. Revelation. 
It is God's truth that relieves our doubts. It is His Spirit bringing His Word to lighten our hearts that clears the fog of confusion about spiritual truth. So we must seek after that truth, and we've got to cling to it. We must make every effort to find it, to absorb it, and cling to it. And too often, uh, those who need that truth the most uh, neglect it. Uh, and then begin to wallow in doubt and begin to think poorly. And when the sources of truth and wisdom that are readily available to them are the thing they need the very most. But by spurning the truth, but they begin to spiral down into doubt and confusion and sometimes into unbelief. So John's disciples went to Jesus. Uh, they expressed to him the question John had in his heart, and Jesus reveals himself to them and to John in both deed and word. At that very time, Luke says, the Lord cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were uh, blind. So the way Luke expresses it literally, in that exact hour, uh, leads us to believe that Jesus timed, as it were, this explosion of miracles of mercy to correspond with the arrival of John's disciples, as if God was divinely accrediting his status and the mission for which he had sent him. In your outline, some of you have a copy, I express this as Jesus validating uh, his ministry. I borrowed that from Kent Hughes, who uh, colorfully described what Jesus did as a riot of healing in which both the healed and their loved ones whooped for joy. Well, that's a fair uh, characterization, and we're meant to understand it in that way. Uh, but the Lord knew that miracles alone were not sufficient to answer their question. And so in verse 22, look down please, uh, he makes sure to give them uh, the interpretation of the miracles in language that he knew John the Baptist would understand. They're to go back to their master and tell him what they had seen and heard. And then he provides them the specific examples for them to repeat. Here they are, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news, the gospel uh, preached to them. That may seem like a laundry list of sorts to you and me, but when they went and repeated it to John, he would invest more meaning in the words, for these were all snippets of prophecy found in different passages in the prophecy of Isaiah, which pointed to what Messiah would perform when he came. And so behind the list lies these. Isaiah 29, 18. On that day, the deaf will hear words of a book and the blind will see. Isaiah 35, verse 5 and following. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Also Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty ca to captives, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. So here are the answers uh, to John's uh, questions. They were all messianic passages uh, that John the Baptist would have recognized. I think it's important for us to think about that. <laughs> He was a student of the scriptures. He, he would have recognized these more than you and me, more, more than the teachers uh, here at the church. He would have recognized these. Those were songs he recognized. He recognized uh, 
the melody. So uh, only that last one from Isaiah 61, uh, Jesus did not repeat uh, the day of vengeance of our God. Would John notice? Would he notice the omission? Would he begin to understand that Messiah's mission in the moment was to undertake these, these other things, including especially the promise that he was to bring good news to the poor? The day of vengeance was still to come, certainly, only there was much more Messiah had to accomplish before that day's fulfillment. And the good news Jesus was bringing was the essential accomplishment absorbing his attention, even at that moment. It was the greatest of news, but though Isaiah had foreseen it, foreseen it also and prophesied even of it in passages like the Suffering Servant Song of Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12, uh, there were few, it seemed, who, who could comprehend it. We know that from, from reading the Gospels. And that explains, I think, that the somewhat enigmatic final blessing with which the Lord concludes in verse 23, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Raise your hand if you've never been confused about that scripture. Here's my take. It's, it's not a reprimand uh, to John, but rather an encouraging call to persevere. It is a call to unbending trust in him. It is a call to both John and any, to any other person who would consider following after Jesus Christ to not set the terms of one's discipleship, but yield instead in faith to the ways of the Son of God. And that word, uh, take offense, is uh, the Greek word for cause to stumble. It's a common word in our New Testament, scandalizo. It has the sense here of stumbling over the person of Jesus or the ways of Jesus or the teaching of Jesus when they don't match up with who you want him to be or uh, how you want him to act or what you wish he would say. Uh, it becomes an offense to such a person and he's tripped up uh, by such thoughts as these. The message Jesus sent to John, but again also the message he's, he's, he's giving to us uh, today, is to not fall away by presuming to know better than Jesus, but rather persevere and find your faith strengthened. John had a vision, I think this is right, a, a conviction of what Messiah's profile was going to be, a mighty a conqueror, a messiah of flame and fire. But instead, uh, Jesus seemed distracted by, by helping the helpless. And Jesus urged trust, trust. Well, there's so much application in that uh, because the religious landscape is littered with people who have uh, followed Jesus up to a certain uh, point. Uh, when they find that he has disappointed them by not giving them what they desire or by not removing what they desperately wish he would remove or when the world is not the place they think he could make it if he would only make things right or if he were only just. I can't follow after Jesus if he doesn't prevent a sick maniac from killing defenseless children and, being, and, and bringing endless misery to all their families and friends. I can't follow Jesus since he hasn't rescued me from my broken marriage or from my disappointing career or my woeful material life or a hateful parent. The list is endless because we live in a sin-ridden and broken world and the prescriptions that we receive 
uh, from Jesus are often difficult to take. We don't like them. They're distasteful uh, to us. In the day of judgment, many will be found who to have rejected his offer of salvation because they didn't like the terms. They would not stoop to enter in by the narrow gate and, and humbly come to the throne of grace. But Jesus knows what he is doing, and he beckons us to have absolute trust in him and not to stumble instead. And people do who do uh, trust him and allow him to set the agenda, discover the deep meaning in the Lord's words that they, that we're blessed. And we know what that word means, uh, blessed. Uh, we are the recipients of God's own love, mercy, and peace. And we find that rather than taking offense, our trust in him increases and our blessing multiplies. And that was the encouragement uh, the Lord was giving John through his disciples. But Jesus also knew human nature perfectly, so he immediately moved to head off any false impressions that could be read into his comment that perhaps he was rebuking uh, John for his question by making clear that according to his perspective, John was the greatest of men. And so we pick it back up again in verse 24 now. When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. The reeds uh, that grow up around streams of, of water, we're out at White Rock Lake all the time, and there's reeds uh, all along the shoreline. Those reeds uh, are characterized by, by their easy uh, movement. The slightest breeze will cause them to sway. And what Jesus was saying was that far from being fickle or a vacillator uh, moved to and fro by every new circumstance, John had shown himself uh, to be a stern and immovable proclaimer of truth. And he had accentuated that resolve in daily practice by adopting the uh, ascetic uniform of the devoted man of God in the mold of Elijah, uh, eschewing the luxurious wardrobe of palace life for a camel's hair coat, a leather belt, and, and sandals. He lived a hard life on the uh, simplest of fares and in the most desolate of places. And if you notice, Jesus' threefold repetition of the question, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? What did you go out into the wilderness to see? What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Forced his uh, listeners to remember how the multitudes had traveled out in droves from the safety of their homes into the wilderness just to see the John they had heard about uh, then. It was a prophet they had gone out to see. And yet Jesus now says he was more even than a prophet because he fulfilled the great prophetic promise of old found in Malachi chapter 3 of a messenger who would uh, prepare the way for Messiah. Uh, so John was not only a prophet, he was also the object of prophecy. Remember, Malachi 3, verse 1 speaks of that messenger whom God uh, would send. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you. But then in the fifth verse of Malachi 4, uh, he prophesied he would send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great 
and terrible day of the Lord. And Matthew records, so we're moving from Malachi uh, 3 verse 1 to Malachi 4 verse 5 to Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. Matthew records how Jesus plainly said, John himself is Elijah who was to come. Uh, Jesus was able to put two and two together. So John was not a vacillating reed blowing in the wind or an effete man of privilege dwelling in king's palaces, but he was a great man, indeed the greatest uh, person ever born of a woman. He's the greatest man who ever lived. Greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, greater than David, because he was forerunner to Messiah, who faithfully bore witness to Messiah. And implicit indication, since these are Jesus' words, that Jesus knew his own role in John's mission. If John was the forerunner, he himself was Messiah. But then he added a serious qualification to his pronouncement in the second line of verse 28. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Jesus wasn't taking back the accolades he had just laid upon John. Rather, he was placing their entire experience into its proper context. Even more important than, according to John, the respect he deserved was membership in the kingdom of God. The people of the kingdom have to be greater than the one who announced the kingdom. John was a conduit of sorts. That's my word, so if you don't like it, <laughs> toss it out. But he was a conduit of sorts, a very important conduit, but nevertheless, a, a man whose role was subsidiary to the thing he pointed to. His, his place in history was important enough to have been the subject of Old Testament prophecy, but it was the coming of Jesus Christ into the world that stirred the angels' passions and set them wondering at God's ways with his creation. The coming of Messiah marked a watershed moment in salvation history. He came announcing that the kingdom of God was at hand and he intended to usher it in. Now, most mister, misunderstood uh, what that meant, but Jesus did indeed bring in the kingdom in the sense of securing the certain membership in the kingdom that belonged to the objects of his saving work. That in itself was proof that possession of a place in that kingdom was more important than preparing the way for the one who would realize it and more important than being the greatest of the prophets who forecast it. Well, in the closing verses, uh, first Luke, then Jesus, uh, remark upon the inevitable opposite responses of those who hear Jesus' message, some believing it, others rejecting it. So we're gonna pick it up now in verse 29. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. I'm gonna uh, add some emphasis on that word purpose here in a moment. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. To what then shall I compare the men of this generation and what are they like? They're like children uh, who sit in the marketplace and call to one another and they say, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine and you say, he has a demon. Uh, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. So these verses uh, 
uh, I would encourage you to see them in this way. They summarize in, in, in capsule uh, form uh, the human experience in response to the message of Jesus as portrayed first with the people in general and then by the actions of the Jewish leaders. In the context, uh, Jesus and John the Baptist are placed side by side. Those who had been baptized in obedience to John's command to repent, they believed Jesus' words. Uh, Luke states that they acknowledged God's justice. And I know most, most of you have in the margin of your Bible the note that that phrase is literally, they justified uh, God. And in putting it that way, Luke, uh, unwittingly, I imagine, uh, gave us a nice illustration of the doctrine the biblical doctrine of justification, because the meaning is not that the people somehow made God just or righteous as though he had not been before, but that they acknowledged it to be true of him. Uh, that's what was really happened. They acknowledged it to be true of him. They issued a verdict of sorts. In a parallel but different way, when God justifies us, in Christ, he's not to be understood as having seen that we are righteous and then pronouncing it, but that he has pronounced us as just because he made us just in his son. So the people didn't make God just, they acknowledged that he was just. Jesus had followed after John and boldly made the will and purposes of God known, but the Pharisees and the lawyers of the Jews refused to acknowledge it. They had also refused John's baptism of repentance. So these two postures uh, went hand in hand. And recognizing that, Jesus goes on to compare them to the fickleness of children, which I doubt they appreciated. Uh, to what then shall I compare the men of this generation? He asked, well, they're like children. Uh, children who are unwilling to play with other children. In, in business, uh, we, we speak of colleagues or, or competitors who uh, are not good at sharing their sandbox. They don't like to play in each other's uh, sandbox. It, it's their way or the highway. Uh, that seems to have been a timeless affliction because the Lord seizes upon that here, uh, barring what was probably the common imagery of children trying to play games uh, with each other, but who <coughs> refused to cooperate. Anyone ever seen that? Uh, they they want to play, but they can't get along. They can't, they, they can't cooperate with each other. No one's willing to do what the other one uh, wants to do. They refuse to be pleased with any suggestion that the other child uh, makes. So John had come in, Jesus is saying, with this austere lifestyle, uh, refusing good food, refusing wine, and they said he had a demon. Jesus had come uh, not minding uh, petty uh, diet suggestions. If only he could reach the lost people, and they accused him of being a gluttonous drunk. So whether it was a dance suggested or a dirge, they refused both. Uh, their problem was not their preferences or their scruples, but their hearts. They refused to believe the truth. And Jesus laid out their hypocrisy before them in these very simple uh, terms. But now there are witnesses uh, also to the truth of what Jesus says. That's the gist of the last verse, verse 35, yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. And here in this context, when he speaks of wisdom, the Lord had to have had in mind God's perfect purposes as he has revealed them. And we can see the connection then up in verse 30, I pointed it out earlier, uh, those who did not believe either John or Jesus were rejecting God's purposes for themselves. The rightness of God's purposes are demonstrated by those who have accepted them. That is, the claims of wisdom are proved to be true by her children. That's why we're here. <laughs> That's why we're all here 
on this uh, Lord's Day morning. Uh, God's uh, wise purposes have blossomed in us and our life experiences are announcing the legitimacy of those purposes. By God's grace, our lives are a kind of verdict vindicating God's perfect wisdom. By way of conclusion, I'd like to pull all this together and give it some cohesion. I, I think it's the way my mind works, but I always like to find what is connecting. I'm not unique in this, but I'd like to especially to find out what's connecting the various passages the writers of Scripture have given us. I want to understand the flow of the author's mind. And so I said at the beginning that our passage today is more than an interlude uh, separating what has come before from what follows, uh, but more commentary that brings them together and unfolds their meaning. Uh, Jesus has been the focal point of the last few chapters, his teaching. Uh, his triumph over Satan's temptations, uh, the avalanche of acts of mercy he's performed, healings and cleansings and all sorts of compassionate expressions of love. He is the focus of this passage, and he will be the focus as we go along. What we have not yet seen is the cross. That's technically not true. We did at his birth, but what we really haven't seen is an active discussion of the, the cross. Uh, we've not yet glimpsed what John uh, will eventually view in Revelation chapter 5 of a lamb standing as if slain in heaven who has purchased for God with his blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Jesus recommended to John the Baptist the blessing of not stumbling. The cross is the stone of stumbling. You know, Mike uh, Black likes to occasionally personalize his messages here uh, by tying them to what we practice at Believer's Chapel. You know how he does that. He, here at Believer's Chapel is the bedrock of the Reformation. And, uh, but he does that. And it's true that the message of the cross is something of the sine qua non of our church. It's on the front page of the bulletin. If you have one, you can... You can glance at it. The word of the cross, our, our, our bulletin is emblazoned with this. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of, of God. But it's true for the big C church as well. The church and the members of the church stand or fall on their allegiance to Jesus Christ and on the saving work he accomplished on the cross at Calvary. I listened to one of Al Moeller's uh, podcasts yesterday. Moeller is the president of Southern Baptist Seminary um, in Louisville, Kentucky. He's a prodigious um, preacher and uh, writer and he has a podcast uh, called The Briefing in which he talk, uh, talks about how to view current events from a biblical perspective. I listened to one yesterday, and the topic was the 100th anniversary of the sermon that Harry, Fosdick, Harry Emerson Fosdick preached entitled, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? Shall the Fundamentalists Win? Now, 100 years ago, uh, the term fundamentalism was synonymous simply with the gospel. I think it's fair to say that. So Fosdick's concern in his sermon was whether the, the church would continue holding to the truths of the, the virgin birth, uh, the deity of Christ, uh, the ne necessity of the blood atonement accomplished by Christ on the cross. Would the church continue uh, to hold to what Fosdick thought were the antiquated idea uh, that Jesus Christ would one day personally return to earth, establish his kingdom, and, and one day judge all mankind? Or would the church take matters into her own hands and, and mold a message that would be better received by the modern age? Shall the fundamentalists win? Uh, Fosdick hoped not. 
He hoped they would not win. And so that's what he tirelessly worked for. And to some degree, he succeeded as witnessed by what eventually tra transpired at, at, at most of those historic uh, denominations in, in America. And some of you know that J. Gresham Machen, uh, the, the uh, brilliant uh, biblicist uh, from Princeton, Princeton, wrote his book, Christianity and Liberalism, as a response to uh, Fosdick's sermon. And Machen maintained that though liberalism, which is another word for what Fosdick believed, that though liberalism wore the garb of Christianity, the reality was Christianity and liberalism were two totally different religions. And the reason I bring this up is that the conflict Machen and the evangelical church faced in the early 1920s is the same one Jesus identified in Luke's history. It's the same conflict. A Christianity that proclaims Christ according to terms palatable to the philosophies of the day, but with the real Jesus Christ and the foundation of his infallible word canceled, may be the kind of accommodationist religion that makes one comfortable, but it's not the Christianity of Jesus Christ. And that's the message from our passage today and its application to all of us. It's the blessing of belief and the wisdom of belief in the message of the Jesus Christ who walked this earth and of whom Luke writes in his gospel. And we adhere to it only by his grace and according to his good pleasure. And we rejoice in his faithfulness to us. His wisdom has made us blessed. Look at the blessed. We're here. Let's give him thanks. Father, we do thank you uh, for the truth of the gospel. We do thank you for the testimony of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, which has convinced us uh, that Jesus came uh, to save sinners, and he did save them. Uh, you, you didn't spare your own son. You delivered him up over for us all. And uh, he accomplished uh, all that you sent him for. May we always be faithful to that. We pray that. I know every Sunday, Lord, but it really is our fervent hope and desire that uh, we won't stray. Uh, we won't accommodate. Uh, we won't compromise. Uh, but we'll uh, make the word of the cross uh, the central message of our church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.